most of us are all aware of the last few verses in the Old Testament of Ecclesiastes where the great writer said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. I would like for us to focus in on what is heard around here quite a bit. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. There are numerous places in the Bible that emphasize that it's man's duty to render obedience to God. When you think of Hebrews 5 and verse 9, that our Lord is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him, then just those two verses alone, one from the old and one from the new, makes us fully aware of the importance of obedience. Now let's emphasize again that if we have a correct faith in God, in Christ, in God's Word, it will come from God's Word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith is confidence in God. Faith is trust in God. It's belief in God. But it's belief in God based upon what God's told us, what's in His Word. It's not just saying, well, I believe God for this, and without anything in the Bible, it'll be okay. No, our faith is formed by the testimony of the Scriptures. That's why faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So if I have confidence in God, then it's because what the Bible told me. If I believe God for certain things because what the Bible teaches God has said He will or will not do as the case may be. But whatever the case, if a faith is not strong enough to cause a person to obey God, then it's a dead faith. James talked about a dead faith, saying faith apart from works is dead. What he's saying is faith apart from obedience to God is dead. He's saying that you show me your faith apart from your works, apart from your obedience, and I'll show you my faith by my works or by my obedience. Now, the truth of the matter is, nobody can show to anybody else, especially God, their confidence and trust in God, which is on the basis of what God told them in His Word, except that they render obedience to God's will. Think for a moment. Let's say that you're going to say to God or to a human being, I'm going to demonstrate to you my faith in God. But I'm going to do it without doing a thing He told me to do. I'm going to do it without obeying Him. The same will be true of love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Again, it comes back to obedience. John 14, 15. Well, what if you were to decide, I'm going to show God how much I love Him, how much I love His Word, how much I love all that He's done for me, I could never do for myself that I learned the Bible. But, you said, I'm going to do it without obeying any commandment God ever gave man. Well, just how would you do it? So, you see, we show our love of God and our faith in God and godly things, and that includes even the Bible as the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, by rendering obedience to God. So that tells us we better know what it is on your part and mine to obey God. Even occasional readers of the Scriptures soon then, just think of what we've just been saying, become aware that the Bible abounds with passages emphasizing the obligation of all responsible persons. And by that I mean we are accountable to God for our thinking and our speaking and our actions. We're responsible to Him for that. And we understand it. But for all responsible persons to submit to the will of the Lord as a condition precedent to our salvation. So a person is not going to be saved by God from sin, sin being the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, without obedience. So I'm concerned, how do I know I have fully obeyed whatever it is that God's told me to do as it relates to my salvation? Now one reason I'm delivering this lesson 
aside from it being the truth and we need it, is because sometimes you hear me say, do what God said do, in the way God said do it, and for the reason, if there's more than one reason, reasons God said do it. And I've often said, well, that's the way you can examine yourself to make sure you have completely rendered obedience to whatever it is that God's commanded you to do, that you've complied with His will. Paul, probably we can safely say the greatest of the apostles of Jesus Christ, warned that the Creator will render vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the, of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. Now, while there are numbers of verses like this one, surely this one alone says you better be sure you've obeyed what God said do in order to be saved from your sins and to remain faithful as a child of God. But we notice our Lord Himself as the Apostle Matthew recorded it by inspiration in Matthew 7 and verse 21. Our Lord said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now listen. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Again, these passages are saying just a nonchalant approach to God and His Word won't get it. You can't just say, yeah, that's the Bible, it's God's Word, it was written to direct us, and that's what He says I ought to do, and then I just go right ahead and do as I please. Uh, Jesus was addressing a lot of folks in His day that were like that. So you can't say, well, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. And then not busy yourself about learning His will and putting it into practice in your life. Now, to this, what said Matthew 7.21, He later added, And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6 and verse 46. So when certain Jews exhibited an interest in Him, and that was good. And an interest in the teaching that he offered them. And that certainly was fine. But they evidenced what I guess we could say is a shallowness of conviction. Then Jesus said to them, If ye continue in my word. What then? Then are ye my disciples. A disciple is a learner. Then, as you continue in His Word, you're my disciples indeed, that is, in your deeds. And, if something else goes along with this, for the person who will continue in His Word, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Well, the question automatically comes up, what about the person that will not continue in His Word? Well, the very point Jesus is making, you stay with studying the Bible to learn my will with the determination to carry it out in your life and you're going to learn the truth. You're going to learn the truth which is the only thing that can make you free from sin. So if you don't do this, if you're not sure that what you believe is from the Bible, from God's Word, if you're not sure that you are fully from the heart obedient to God, then you're not sure of your salvation. And that's a very important point. God would want every man to know he's saved. Or not saved, and if not saved, what to do in order to be saved. I think we can safely agree that's what God wants people to know. If you're lost, you need to learn what to do to be saved. You need to understand what sin is, what sin does, and it's the only thing that can separate you from God. And that Jesus Christ saw the sin problem, and that's why the gospel of Christ, the glad tidings of Christ, is God's power to save us. God can save us any way He wanted to, but He located His power to save us from sin in the gospel of Christ. And we've already made it clear from the Bible that that gospel which has God's power in it to save us from sin will not save us from sin if we're not obedient to the truth. And that comes by continuing with the study of God's Word. It's persevering. It's staying with something. It's seeing it through. It's just because it gets hard, we don't quit. We stick with it and go that much harder to attain the goal we desire. So what was the nature of the truth 
that sets us free. The truth that our Lord spoke about. Did he intend from this to convey the idea that the blessings he would bestow were dependent on conformity to the gospel by which means salvation in the scriptures is promised? That done in Romans 1, 13 through 17. So again I ask, what does it mean to obey God? Surely we've seen thus far, if we accept the Bible as the Word of God, that obedience is a very, very, very important matter when it comes to your salvation and mine. Does one obey God who ignorantly or otherwise substitutes human reasons for divine ones in approaching Him? Surely these scriptures are indicating to the contrary. Many in the denominational world, and I hate to say so, even in some in the church today, think that such is the case. If you just think very piously about God and whatever it is you're going to do or not do, or how you're going to do it, then automatically God says, stamped, it's approved. And I know that's what a lot of people believe when they, uh, about doing things in the name of the Lord. They don't understand that means by His authority, which authority is expressed only in His Word. And you must be authorized by His Word to, to believe whatever it is you believe if it's except the God. What they think doing everything in the name of the Lord is, is just in the name of Jesus. And then go ahead and do it and that sanctifies us. In the name of Jesus, just run right over that car in front of you because you broke the line. And that sanctifies it. In the name of Jesus, just slap the fire to somebody because he deserved it. In the name of Jesus. He called out in the name of Jesus and everything's all right. That's not what that means when we quote most often whatsoever you do in word or in deed. Do all in the name of Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. It means as the Lord in His word has authorized us to act. And you don't have God in the doing of anything or not doing of anything when you don't have authority in His word to act. It's without faith, because faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. To act without authority is to act without faith. The reason I say so many times that when we say, well, I believe that's what God wants us to do, then we ought to be able to say, here in the Bible it says what we do, because belief comes by hearing the Word of God. And if you can't say, I can find it in the Bible as to what I believe and what I practice, you don't have any business, and you can't scripturally, be saying, well, I believe that's what God wants. If you believe that's what God wants, you can go to the Bible and find out where He said it, where He taught it, where He joined upon us, where it's a part of what we must obey to be well-pleasing to Him. The Scriptures teach that those who do so, as I just described it, substituting whatever they want, are, are wrong. They are egregiously, they are seriously wrong. They are tragically wrong in the advocacy of this view. And that the consequences are nothing less than disastrous and destructive to the souls of those who accept and follow these dangerous doctrines that allows us to think we're all right with God, well pleasing to God, yet we're acting contrary to what He said. That's the reason you come down to where I can say that there are three requisites to obedience. To be sure I fully obeyed God's will and that it's only God's will I'm obeying. Now any one of these requisites, if omitted, if left undone, renders the other two powerless or invalid. First of all, we must do what the Lord said do. We must do what the Lord said do. A lot of people doing a lot of things. They think the Lord said do it. But they never read the Bible to find out whether he did or didn't. That's what some preacher said. Or that's what somebody they have a lot of confidence in said. But did he actually say that's what you're to do? When you break all this down systematically, it's not difficult. It's just a matter of taking the time to do it. So we must do what the Lord said do. The second requisite is that we must do what the Lord said do in the way the Lord said to do it. 
That is in the way and in the manner in which the Lord said to do it. And the third is that we must do what the Lord said do in the way and manner in which the Lord said do it for the reason or reasons that the Lord said do it. Now let me see if I can illustrate this and make it even more clear as to what it is and the importance of this that we might be fully aware and understanding that we've obeyed whatever it is God's commanded us to do. First of all, were the Lord to command us, and follow me please, to go west. Now some of us might have to get a compass out to figure out which way is west, the east, north, the south. But if the Lord commanded us to go west, and we were to go east, we've disobeyed Him. Second point. Were He to bid us to go west, to work in the fields. And we go west, but work in a factory. We've disobeyed him. And the third, were he to command us or instruct us or authorize us or to tell us to go west and work in the fields to earn money to buy a house in which to live, and we go west, Work in the fields to earn money with which to purchase an automobile, then we have disobeyed him. And that's exactly the reason that in analyzing whether we fully from the heart obeyed what God said do, that we have to say, Am I actually doing what he said do? Is the what answer? Have we done it in the way or the manner in which he said do the what? <laughs> and Have we done the what in the manner and in the way for the right reason? Or if he allows more than one reason, reasons that he said do it. Now that's not hard to understand. How would you determine in your own life you've done what somebody told you to do? Let me tell you when it gets serious now. If your wife, husband, tells you here is the grocery list. Here is the grocery list. Now that takes the place of the Word of God. Here's the grocery list. She's manifesting her will. And you're saying by accepting that grocery list with the words on there manifesting her will, you're going to do what she told you to do. And she wants you to go to H-E-B. Not Kroger's. Not any other store, but H-E-B. And she wants you to go to H-E-B because whatever it is she's wanting you to get, they're the ones that handle it. (laughs) Have you ever received instructions like that? And were you well instructed? (laughs) Did you understand the message? Did you have faith in the messenger based upon her word that she knew what she was talking about and what you were supposed to do? And she could say, now I need this. Because I can't fix whatever she's fixing without this. And they only have it at (laughs) H-E-B. Now, there are three things there. Whatever it is she wants, going to H-E-B, and the reason she wants it. Now, let me ask you this. Have you done what your dear wife, whom you claim to love, (laughs) wanted you to do if you mess up on any one of them? I think that's as simple as it can get. So we've not only given you the three requisites, we gave you an illustration and we brought it home to you for the last one. (laughs) So, to obey is to follow the commands of another. Now if you look at any reputable dictionary, you're going to find a definition like that. That happens to come from Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary. What is it? To obey, quote, to follow the commands of another. We thus obey God, there's the another, only when we do what He says 
in the way or the manner he designates it to be done, and for the reason or reasons he specifies. And folks, we recognize that in about everything we do where we're receiving instructions from another that must be carried out by us, and we want to be sure. Let me show you. We've got coming up here in December, Christmas. Now, I'm thinking of it in the common, secular way it's carried out. Santa Claus. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to see who's naughty and nice. You realize all that implies? First of all, it's trying to get the kids to act like they ought to act. That's, that's a challenge. <laughs> Next of all, it is saying that he has a list. And he's saying, you're on that list. And you're on the list on the basis of whether you're naughty or nice. Whatever standard you use to determine naughty or nice, you're just doing what mom and dad tell you to do. So you see, in simple little old things, it make no difference, although children might think it makes a great deal of difference as far as getting a gift or something. But it illustrates well the connection between receiving instructions, somebody's will expressed in words on our level of understanding, and how we discharge those instructions. And tell me where it is that we don't have that. So you see, God hasn't approached us in a way that's so foreign to us. We deal with it all the time. Any other action on our part in such a situation is simply not obedience, but it's disobedience. Uh, we must understand it involves not submission of our will, in this case to God's will as manifest in God's word, but it's the substitution of the human will for the divine will. Now, if we're going to substitute human will for divine will, whose will then are we trusting? Well, we're trusting our will or some other human's will, not God's will. We prove our trust in God and God's will by letting it guide us and instruct us and lead us and by obeying it. So we need to understand that or else we be presumptuous in our activities that leads to fatal error being destroyed in the eyes of God. Could God have come up in any more simple way to show man and to see from man, do we love him and do we have faith in him? When we talk about fundamentals and first principles, this is what we're talking about. And if we don't have these things right, then we're not going to be able to handle the more meaty matters of the law because these never change. The foundation never changes. And we've got to get the foundation right. Because that's going to form our viewpoint of God, of Christ, of the Bible, of what the church is, of salvation, of ourselves, of our duty to one another, of husband, wives, the home, parents, children, anything you want to think of. If the foundations are destroyed, then we're in a mess. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this nation today. The condition essential, you can't do without them, the salvation that are set out in the last will and testament of our Savior Jesus Christ, the New Testament of the Bible, are simple, clear, and unmistakable to anybody that wants to know them. Now, you know if a person doesn't want to know them, not interested, you can teach them all day long, they don't get it. It's not because they don't have the intellectual capacity to get it. They don't care about it. A lot of times people say, well, that guy's dumb as a stump, with apologies to the stump. No, he's not. He doesn't care about what he's talking about. You ever sat in classes where you didn't care a thing in the world about what was being said? Well, the job said you had to be there, and you liked the money in that paycheck, so you went, but you didn't really. You know, here we go again. I hear it all the time from people, especially on up uh, uh, types of jobs that demand meetings. Meetings. Have you ever heard many people say they got much out of umpteen meetings that they go to? <laughs> Not even church business meetings. In order to become a Christian, it's imperative, it's a must that we exercise faith in the Lord and His Word. But without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 6. And Jesus 
uh, Mark's account of Jesus' great commission, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Then we, of course, find the teaching of repentance on the part of one becoming a Christian. Essential to one's salvation. Repent of one's sins. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, that they would all perish if they didn't repent. And then it's said in Acts 17, 30, Paul preached the gospel to Athens that now God commands all men everywhere to repent. It's pretty plain. And then throughout the New Testament, we see that one is to confess. In the total teaching of what the New Testament says on becoming a Christian, one is to confess one's belief or faith in Jesus Christ as a Son of God. Romans 10 and verse 10. Then one is to be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ. Unto, that is for or in order to a given end. In this case, the remission or forgiveness of sins. That's what was said in Acts 2 verse 38. And Peter just plainly comes out and says it. Baptism does also now save us. Those who thus do then are saved from past, that is, alien sins. And are they then added by the Lord Himself to the church that He built and purchased with His own precious blood. Mark 16, 15, and 16. And so many other passages. Acts 2, 38, verse 47. Which, of course, as I say, He built that church. Matthew 16, 18. And wherein are all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, forgiveness of sins or sonship being one of them, Ephesians 1, 3. Now it's in this fashion that one becomes a Christian. Not a hyphenated Christian. There weren't any such things. And when you read your New Testament, you can't find blank Christian or this Christian or that Christian. You just find Christians, members of the church Jesus built. That's all. And I suggest to you, you can have the same thing today if you'll follow His authorized Word, do only what's said in that Word. If you read Acts eleven twenty six, if you note 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, you'll see then that people were Christians and that's all they were as members of the church, a member of the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 19 through 21. And thus, they possess the promise the expectation of eternal life if they live faithful in the church. And that goes back to obedience, doesn't it? Doing what God said, doing the way or manner He said, do it for the reason or reasons He said, do it. As a Christian, 1 John 2, 25, that means so much to us because it gets right down to whether we're going to hear, well done thou what? Good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. The inspired historian Luke in what we know as the historical section of the New Testament, the book of Acts, some of the acts of some of the apostles, has shown that those who thus were obedient to the gospel, as we just studied it in the plan of salvation, met regularly on the first day of the week to engage in worship to God, Acts 20 and verse 7. Now when they engaged in worship of God, they worshiped in spirit and in truth as the truth directed them and their minds set upon what they were doing as it was offered to God as acts of worship. And that involved singing. Singing praises to God. Just singing. The only kind of music authorized in all the New Testament. Just singing. Then there was teaching. Teaching from the Word as we are doing even now. Prayer. Praying to the Father. And then to support the work of the church, the members contributed their means, which they planned and purposed on the basis of their prosperity to cheerfully give to the Lord without grudging. And on that first day of the week in that assembly of worship, then they engaged in the observance of the Lord's Supper to show forth the Lord's death till He come again by partaking of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, the bread representing the body of Christ sacrificed on Calvary's tree on our behalf. And the blood shed for the remission of our sins, the blood of the New Testament. That was regularly observed by the Christians on every single solitary first day of the week. Acts 2, 42, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now that's just how simple, but very significant and important. The worship assembly is, and every Christian involved in that worship assembly engaged in that worship and each of the five acts of worship done in that assembly on the first day of every week. 
Now, Christians may assemble for various reasons to do the work of the church any other day of the week. But on the first day of the week, it is required of them by the Lord in the New Testament to assemble and to engage in worship as we prescribed. There's no fanfare. There's no great blazing out of all sorts of fireworks and stuff and symphonies and all that. It's that simple New Testament worship of the church. It's recorded in your New Testament as all this has been. And one as a Christian is being obedient to God on the first day of the week when he assembles, Hebrews 10, and comes together in that worship as we've described to do the things prescribed by the New Testament. It will be observed that I've noted that there are set out in the New Testament four steps, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism in water to obtain the remission of sins. These are conditions precedent to salvation from past and alien sins. There are those, I fear, in great numbers among us, and of course it's always been characteristic of the denominational world, who probably have no serious objection to the first three, faith, repentance, confession. But the last one, baptism, is where the fight is. Notice it. Just look around you and see. Baptism in water. Is it essential? Essential condition to salvation? And you say yes. The great majority says no. Well, does the Bible teach one way or the other? They do this in spite, in fact, and despite the fact that the Scriptures clearly assert that baptism, when preceded by faith built upon the thus saith the Lord, and repentance and confession is for or in order to unto to reach a given end, the end being the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. That it puts one into Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Galatians 3 and 27, and is the consummating act in God's plan to save a man from sins and make him a Christian. Again, Mark 16, 15 and 16. And Peter said it by inspiration of the Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, baptism doth also now save us. Did Peter lie? I do not think so. Our Savior said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32, as we noticed earlier. The clear and obvious import of this statement is that the only way accountable persons may escape the bondage of sin is by and through obedience to the truth. But, if it is possible to obtain full and complete pardon from sin... By disregarding truth and following error, does this not mean that error is fully as effective in producing salvation as the truth and should therefore be as fully valued? Who believes it? Maybe some who do it, but they would not articulate it as such. In which case, that is, if error is to be valued as much as truth is and followed and taught and Defended as much as truth is, is it not just as well to know error as it is to know the truth in order to have the freedom from sin that we seek? Since in that uh, event, it would be just as valuable as to uh, coming to the end of obtaining salvation. Jesus said that only those who do His will shall enjoy the benefits and blessings of the kingdom Matthew 7 and verse 21. To those who not only do not conform to His will, but who actually oppose it, and who urge others to disregard it, qualify nevertheless for the blessings of it, then truth has no advantage over error. Does that sound like our age? Not even be able to determine what truth is, or that truth is just what you make of it. Though it may contradict what everybody else's idea of truth is. That falsehood is equally acceptable in producing deliverance from the power and presence of sin. Well, the conclusion necessarily follows 
from the premises we are asked to embrace if we're to follow what most people teach is all that's essential to salvation. But the scriptures don't teach that. The scriptures emphasize truth. The scriptures emphasize only doing the truth and rejected all that's contrary to the truth is presented in the Bible. The scriptures make it exceedingly clear that salvation on the one hand and damnation on the other are matters dependent on whether one obeys or disobeys God. As we read in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, how God's going to deal with things when He comes at the end of the world. Only when we wholly, completely, totally yield our wills to the Lord, only when we do what He said, only when we do what He said, do, in the way He said, do it, and for the reason or reasons that He said, do it. Do we obey Him and qualify on His terms for the salvation which He alone can offer and make it effective? The reason for religious dissension and diversion is not because of any ambiguity, of obscurity, of teaching in the Scriptures. You know, the Scripture says it's very plain. The way is so plain that in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 35, 8, so plain that wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. And if any man, we've already learned, will do his will, the Lord's will. He shall know the teaching, John 7 verse 17. The problem is not properly attributable to uh, any difficulty in the divine re relation, but results from a deep-seated, and here's the problem, folks, a deep-seated unwillingness on the part of many people to bring their wills into subjection to the will of God. That's what the problem is. You'll find in most cases it's a problem in getting a person to become a Christian. And once a person becomes a Christian, when he starts to grow, many times that old will evidences itself. And that's the reason people don't grow. I'll be so bold as to say, through knowledge of the Bible, first of all, in my own experience, second of all, and I could say the experience of others has been busy about spreading the word, trying to convict people of sin and get them to change to obey the truth. That members of the Lord's church can be just as hard to get them to submit their will to the Lord's will concerning living the Christian life as anybody outside the church ever thought about being when it comes to getting them to understand a plan of salvation to become Christians. Our obligation to all lost people as the church of the living God, is exceedingly great. It's neither narrow nor sectarian to urge that in order to enjoy the approval of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, here on this earth, and the great and glorious bliss of heaven hereafter, we must abide in the teaching and do His will. Matthew 7, 21, and John echoed it to Christians in 2 John 9. We, we do not serve the cause of our Savior, nor do we contribute to the well-being of those in error by minimizing or setting aside the importance of full and faithful, a faithful response to our Lord's command. You're not being kind to people and you're not loving them. Try to say, well, that's all right. You don't have to do that. Many of us think we love people just about like the old doty grandpa or grandma does when little granddaughter gets all upset. Says, oh, it's all right, honey. You don't have to do that. The Lord never will say that. And you can't outlove Him. Whatever requirements He sets out in His infallible Word will meet us on the Day of Judgment, John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. It's incumbent then upon us to develop a spirit of humility and meekness that says whatever it is he says, I'm going to do what he said in the way of the manner in which he said do it and for the reason or reasons which he said do it. For I want to be fully compliant with his will for I have no other way of showing him my love of him and my faith in him to save me from my sins. 
if I set aside any one of those requisites that have to do with being fully compliant with his will. If we could get that across, folks, and practice it daily, what a difference it would make in all our lives. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we urge you to become one. If you have become a Christian but failed in sin, then the Lord demands, He requires that you repent of those sins in His second law of pardon. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Folks, He meant what He said and He said what He meant. Please believe Him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we bid you come while we stand and sing.